I want to uh, address the question in this session, how do we become servant leaders? And I don't know if any other area where the how to do it is more important than in this one. The source of the servant nature is Jesus Christ, the Lord. It's not something we do, it's something we become. And I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, to the second chapter of uh, Paul's letter to, to the Philippians. Chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Begins, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. I don't know about you, but from time to time I find the Apostle Paul very irritating, with statements like that. <laughs> Let your attitude, how do you let an attitude be? Paul says in Ephesians, be strong, says Paul. How can you be strong? Either you're strong or you're not strong. How can you be strong? Well, I'll come to that. Let your attitude, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ <laughs> Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Why don't you follow the, the sequence of Paul's argument in Philippians 2 concerning Christ. And Paul makes these important statements. First, Jesus was in very nature God. In other words, Jesus was God in person. Very important to understand. He wasn't God-like, he wasn't divine as an adjective, he was an essence in being God. That was his nature. Then the amazing statement that being in very nature God, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped at, not to be grasped. In a sense, we lose our way already, don't we? <clears throat> but somehow, being God, that was something that God held lightly, Jesus held lightly in his hands. The very equality, the being of God was something not to be grasped. Thirdly, <clears throat> even more mysterious, he emptied himself. Theologians have struggled with for years, for centuries, over the significance of that, kenosis. Whether Jesus emptied himself of relative absolutes or relative attributes or absolute attributes and so on, I do not know. What I do know is that what he emptied himself of were, were, were good things, not bad things. In fact, were perfections. That Jesus emptied himself of certain perfections that had to do with his position and his nature as being God. There was a self-emptying by the Divine Son. And the fourth, and this is the important one, <coughs> he became <coughs> in very nature servant. He who was in very nature God became in very nature servant. He was as much servant in his essential essence and character and being and motivation as he was God in very essence, nature, character, being and motivation. And there was created in the incarnation 
a servant nature, a thoroughly servant nature. I don't know how to express it adequately. But he who was in very nature, his whole being, his motivation, his character, everything, God, became in nature and being and motivation and essence, servant. Fifthly, he was made in human likeness. In other words, that servant nature was a servant nature belonging to a man. It wasn't some superhuman or superhuman uh, expression of, of, of God's nature. It was a man. And because it's a man, it's accessible to us. That's the important point. There was created a human nature that is an essential being and character and motivation servant. And that, that was the character and the motivation of Jesus. It, when it says that the Son of a Man is among you as one who serves, it does not mean that he did serving things. He did, for sure. Whatever he did, he did out of a servant. That's who he was. He was in very nature servant. And that's the important leap. Here, God steps from the infinite to the finite to become a servant, and to the human to become a servant man. Fifthly, sixthly rather, he was obedient to death. Now the significance of that is, is at least twofold. One is this. One of the conditions of human nature biblically is that death seals it eternally in its essential moral nature. After death there is no radical moral change possible. That's why the Bible says that of him that be, is holy be holy still. Of him that is filthy be filthy still. At the point of death, our, our nature is sealed in its essential moral characteristic. And from there on, we just become more and more of what we are at the point of death. The believer becomes more, for all eternity, becomes more and more and more like Jesus. That's the amazing thing. You're going to spend all eternity becoming more and more conformed to the image of God's Son. What uh, A.W. Tozer used to call the law of moral gravitation. The unbeliever, sadly, becomes more and more rebellious, more and more alienated, more and more evil, more and more lost, and so on. Death seals it permanently, totally, in its essential moral characteristic. When Jesus died on the cross, his humanity was sealed eternally in its characteristic at that point. That's got some incredible implications for us. For example, his human nature was sealed in its sinlessness. See, let, let, me, let me come at it this way. There were certain things in his humanity that Jesus created that had never existed before. One of the things that Jesus... See, it's important. Paul says we are reconciled to God by his death. We are saved by his life. The incarnate life of Jesus is amazingly important for us. We're saved by his life. Jesus, in his humanity, created these things that had never, ever existed before. Number one, he created a perfect human love for righteousness. Now, God has always perfectly loved righteousness. The angels who didn't sin perfectly love righteousness. To some degree, we love righteousness. But he was a man who, who perfectly loved righteousness. All the, time, all the time when Jesus was living and doing the Father's will, there was growing in his human heart an increasing delight in doing the Father's will. I do always the things that please the Father. I delight to do thy will, O God. In the volume of the book that's written of me, uh, God, Jesus was taking the law of God and internalizing it on his heart. He was writing the law of God in his nature, see. 
And in the life of Jesus, all his, all his incarnate life had increased and increased and increased and increased. The love for doing God's will. But when Jesus comes to the cross, when he comes to the cross, and he accepts that as the Father's will, and realizes that beyond that, beyond hell, there was the redemption of a world. There was the final solution of the sin problem, the Father's will, that way. The Father's will was going to achieve all that. There was sealed in the human heart of Jesus a perfect, absolutely perfect human love for righteousness. That never existed before. Second thing Jesus created that never existed before was a perfect human hatred for sin. Now, God perfectly hates sin. God's hatred against sin is implacable. Eternal enmity against sin in the heart of God. The angels who have never fallen perfectly hate sin. To some extent, we dislike sin. I don't know whether we go as far as say we hate it. That's my problem. I don't hate sin enough, see. Probably because we're stained by it, see. But Jesus, when he lived as a sinless man among sinless men and women and saw the effects of sin on his precious creation, there grew in the human heart of Jesus an increasing human hatred for sin. He stands in front of the tomb of Lazarus. John says he groaned within himself. The literal meaning of the word is not sorrow. It means strong, strong displeasure. Because Jesus realized that his best friend was a corpse behind that rock, and sin had done it. And there was in the heart of Jesus a hatred against sin. That's why he said, roll the stone away, Lazarus come forth. And a man, dead four days, comes out of the grave. See, there was in the heart of Jesus a hatred for sin. But when Jesus came to the cross, when he came to Calvary, and he was made sin for us. And again, I, I say those words, I can't contemplate it, what, it, what it meant. For the sinless Son of God, that perfect personality, that gracious, wonderful, compassionate, loving, strong, enduring, generous heart, to suddenly become sin for us. There was sealed in the human heart of Jesus a perfect, implacable, unchanging human hatred for sin. That never existed before, see. Never existed before, see. Thirdly, the thing Jesus created was he created a perfect human knowledge of God. Now, to some extent, men and women have known God. Never before has a man perfectly known God. Came from the Father's bosom. Just think of all the things that Jesus talk, talked about the Father. How did he find out? Father knows what you need before you ask him. How did Jesus discover that out of his own experience? Father sees in secret and rewards you openly. How did Jesus discover that? Out of his own heart. And out, out of that perfect knowledge of God, there came a perfect self-knowledge. He knew himself. There's a remarkable verse in John chapter 13, just before the Last Supper. This is what it says. Jesus, knowing, perfectly knowing, perfectly knowing that he came from God, and perfectly knowing he was going to go back to God, took a towel and girded himself. Now, we don't know ourselves. I mean, our conscious mind is only the tip of the iceberg. Most, most of our motivation is buried. It's unconscious drives, it's past history and so on. We know ourselves only imperfectly. We know in part. I believe when Jesus came to the Last Supper, he had no unconscious mind. I, I think everything was known. He perfectly, totally, absolutely knew himself. That never existed before. Now, all, all that... All that and, and its perfect sinlessness was sealed up in one human personality. And death sealed that permanently in that nature. See. So when Jesus rose from the dead, for example, the devil couldn't even tempt him anymore. Christ being raised from the dead dies no more, Paul says. Death has no more dominion over him. The dominion of death is what? Sin. Sin has no more dominion over him. The devil couldn't even get to Jesus to tempt him. See. It must be a very comfortable, uncomfortable time for the devil. But up until the cross, you see, all that is locked up in one individual personality. There is a remarkable passage in John chapter 7, when Jesus is in the temple at the Feast of Tabernacles. And part of the ritual of that day was to take uh, pitchers of water from the pool of Siloam and pour them out at the base of the altar in front of the temple. And it seems that Jesus was standing watching that ceremony, because something stirs in his spirit. It's the only time... In the Gospels, you find Jesus shouting out because it says he stood and cried. If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes on me, out of his belly, good old Anglo-Saxon word, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. And John puts a little editorial note. 
he says he was speaking about the Holy Spirit. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Why was the Holy Spirit not yet given? The Holy Spirit was involved in the creation of that human personality of Jesus. Everything Jesus did as a man, he did, he did on, in his ministry rather, he did as a man filled with the Holy Spirit. When he healed the sick, Jesus of Nazareth, a man anointed with power and with the Holy Spirit, went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. When he cast out demons, if I by the Spirit of God cast out demons, the kingdom of God has come. Stands up in the synagogue in Capernaum, says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel. He was the gospel. When he preached the gospel, he preached by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. The power that Jesus manifested in his ministry was remarkable power. Listen, it was something less than omnipotence because it says he could do no mighty works here because they've done belief. Omnipotence doesn't have limits. See. Jesus was modeling something. What? He was modeling the kind of life a man can live filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit was engaged in all of that. Jesus internalizing the law of God in his heart, producing a heart perfectly in sympathy with the Father, perfectly one with the Father, perfectly hating sin, perfectly loving righteousness, a perfect servant, see. And death sealed that nature permanently in its servanthood. The second important thing I mentioned yesterday, I want to come back to, all that up until the cross is locked up in one personality, the human life of Jesus. All that victory over sin, all that, that uh, servanthood, all that uh, love for righteousness, but when Jesus comes to the cross, his individual personality becomes a corporate one. He incorporates us into him. See? And we get access to that. See? Now, John says, up until the cross, the Holy Spirit was not yet given. Jesus goes to the cross, he deals with the problem of human sin, <clears throat> and still the Holy Spirit is not given. See? Jesus is raised from the dead, meets the disciples in the upper room, breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. See? And the Holy Spirit is given in a measure. See? Then after the resurrection, when that victorious human life is seated in the place of authority, the right hand of the majesty on high, then the Holy Spirit is given. See? This is the point I want to ask you. <clears throat> Where today is that human nature of Jesus? which perfectly loves God, perfectly hates sin, perfectly knows God, perfectly knows itself, perfectly sinless, internalized, the law of God internalized. Now, where is that nature today? You know where it is? It's in you. It's born in you by the Holy Spirit. See? Do you understand, you see, that every one of us, what God has done... God takes a lot of diverse peoples, all sorts of shapes and sizes. And in us there is born this life of Jesus that perfectly hates sin, perfectly loves God, perfectly serves Him, perfectly knows itself, born in us. We can't develop that life. It's the work of the Holy Spirit to enlarge that life of God in us, of Christ in us. Our responsibility is to deal with the works of the flesh outside. That's why so much of the epistles are negative. Don't do things. See, we can get rid of the weeds, get rid of the op opposition. We can't develop the life of God that's in us. I remember some years ago, uh, my mother died. <clears throat> she was uh, well in her 80s, uh, very glad to go and be with my father and be with the Lord. And we were with her three days and three nights in the hospital before she died. She actually died with her head in my hand. I would not have missed that for anything. The point I want to make is this. The last three days of my mother's life were so incredibly beautiful, I've never forgotten it. If she'd lived all her life like that, she could easily have been canonized. You know, the immediate past had disappeared, but what had happened to her as a girl of 15, 70 years before, when, when she got saved, was as real and as fresh as though it just happened yesterday. I've never forgotten, because I realized that when we die, or when Jesus comes, all we leave behind is the unfinished work of the flesh. And all that survives into the ages to come 
is what God has done in our life. But here's what I want to understand. When God has finished his work in us, you will have he will, his kingdom ruled on his by a vast hold of some created things with a free, moral, sovereign human will. But who now, because of the cross, perfectly, perfectly love righteousness, perfectly hate sin, perfectly know God, perfectly themselves, have a thick servant heart, then God will affect the universe of the devil and all his angels. they even be the possibility of another fall. That possibility of another fall will be non-existent. I used to wonder many times why Jesus took so long to get us saved. Why didn't he come from heaven on Friday afternoon as a full-grown man, die on the cross, be buried in uh, three days, rise on Sunday uh, morning, go back to heaven, Monday morning, all been done in a long weekend. See. <laughs> Why did Jesus take so long? Be because he was creating something. See. He was creating a human nature that's going to that's going to survive on into eternity in us. It's going to be like that. See, that's the final solution to the sin problem. See, that's the victory of the cross. See, that's why that's why Jesus. Uh, rejected, bowing down to Satan, getting the kings of the world, world that way. He was after something greater than that. That was the cross, see. But out of that, <clears throat> out of that, along with the sin question being solved, through the death of Jesus, we are brought in touch with his servant nature. Now the experience... <clears throat> of the servant nature of Christ is part of the work of sanctification. And my experience has been this, that for Christ to bring us through to where he stands in very nature servant, he has to take us through the stages he walked himself. And I believe it involves these very important things. Number one, not to be grasped. Leadership is not to be grasped. We say, but I'm, I'm, I'm called to, lead it, to leadership, not to be grasped. That's my gifting, my God-given gifting, not to be grasped. That's been the most productive thing in my ministry, not to be grasped. And God begins to deal with us over the thing that is the most important to us in our life. And the most important thing to us in our life is our calling. What we're called to be, what we're called to do. And God touches that very, very essential thing that becomes the substance of all our importance to God and all, all our importance to ourselves, and God says not to be grasped. I can remember vividly the time when God dealt with me over that issue in the church that I'd been used under God to found in New Zealand. I loved that church. I know it's not the greatest church in the, in the world. Yours it probably is, but it was the one I loved more than any other church. You said, I don't want to anywhere else but here when Jesus comes so we can show what we've been trying to do. I love that place. It's been born out of my heart. See. And God said to me one time, I want you to be willing to go down to that church for here on out and just be a member in the pew. Just sit in the pew Sunday by Sunday. Oh, we don't have pews, chairs. Just listen to other people preaching, knowing that you could preach much better than they could and give them half a chance. See. Let it go, let it go, let it go. Easy to say, not easy to do. Oh, I struggled over that. Not to be grasped. That's where it begins. Jesus reckoned his position as equality with inequality with God not to be grasped, to be held very lightly. See. God begins to deal with us over that specific issue. The second stage is generally even longer. Empty yourself. Empty yourself. 
And that is something that you have to do. God will not do it for you. No good praying, Lord, empty me. He won't. He'll say, well, empty yourself. Which means taking all the positive things in our life and one by one letting them go at the foot of the cross. Not your weaknesses, now your strengths, your motivations, your abilities, the things you do well, the things that are the most important contribution in your life to the work of God. Empty yourself, let it go, lay it down. And the Holy Spirit deals with us very meticulously and very persistently over those specific things. I discovered it's a very specific thing. God's a very stubborn God, and He'll stay with something until we're really willing to let it go. It's a process of self emptying. And the Holy Spirit begins to put His finger on very important things in our life. And we think, God, if that goes, what have I got left? If I lay that down, what have I got? That's what justifies my place in the body of Christ. God, that's the thing you gave me. I can remember the day you gave that to me. And the gifts of God are, are without, without repentance, remember God. See? So empty yourself. That's why he will not take us from us. See? We have to let it go. And just when you think you're, you've got through it, <clears throat> the Lord opens another door, and the most important thing in your life is there. He wants that too. I discovered the last thing the last thing we ever let go to God, there is in all of our lives an inner kind of citadel that represents you. We'll give God our job, we'll give God our money, we'll give God our gifts, we'll give God our, our quali qualities, we'll give, give God our ministry, we'll give God our relationships, we'll give, we'll give, we'll give, we'll give. But there's a last thing it's the last thing we ever let go to God. That's us. There's an inner, inner kind of citadel. To me, it's a kind of a meager point. God narrows us down. Paul was a very narrow man. God narrowed him down. Everything I can't but loss, all my past, all my ministry, all my gifts, everything I've done, narrowed down to just one thing. And there is an meager point like that when we open the last door that represents ourself. I can remember a businessman in New Zealand some years ago, Plymouth Brethren brother. Never hadn't met him before. He rang me up one day and asked to see me. And I went along to his office. He, he had a, been, a, been a very prosperous businessman, had about three very successful businesses. And uh, he told me that about six months before, he and his wife had said, Lord, we want to be completely sold out to you. We want, we want just everything. We want to do it. You can have everything. He said, they said, Lord, do with us what you need to do to bring us to that place. And from that time on, his business had started getting into problems. When he saw me, he was on the verge of bankruptcy, and he was desperate. He said, what's God doing? I've given him everything. I said, the one thing God wants, he still haven't given us you. Now, when God has got us, he's got everything else. If he hasn't got that, everything else is at risk. Have you ever said, Lord, I've laid everything on the altar, then I take it back? If I lay everything on the altar and take it back, there's some non-given part that I've been standing on that's not yielded, that I can even manage to take it back. There is here a point of no return. A point of no return. After God has got that, I do not think backsliding is a viable option. <laughs> now I mention that because you know there, there are so many people in the church today who have been through everything, been baptized in the Holy Spirit, operated the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and today they're nowhere. Some of them are walking right out in the world. Why? I think it's over. It's over. It's over this issue. When we get past that, then then you're gone. There's, there's, there's nothing left. This brother said to me, he said, he said, what does God want? He said, God wants you. See. He struggled over it for hours. He said, I don't know what's going to happen uh, if I do that. Well, how do you do it? See? When you get to that point, there's nothing you can actually do. It's just a matter that you have to give up. See. It's unconditional surrender. See. It's not more blessing you need, not more strength you need, not more faith you need, more commitment you need. See. At, that, at that point, 
It's, it's, just, it's just a surrender. I remember some years ago, in, a couple of years ago in, uh, in, in Switzerland, a young Israeli girl, remarkable young woman, brought up in an agnostic Jewish home in Tel Aviv. When she was about 15 or 16, she had a great hunger to know God. Decided that after a while the address God had left was in Jerusalem, so Jerusalem would be the place to start. So she went to Jerusalem, went to the Wailing Wall, wrote a letter to God saying, God, I want to meet you. Stuck it in a crack in the Wailing Wall and waited for God to answer. Waited there for, for about an hour and nothing happened. So she decided, well, she was so unimportant, God obviously wasn't interested in it. Saw the, dome, the mosque the, up on the dome of the, of the uh, rock. Thought, well, perhaps the Mohammedan God might be interested. She went up there and tried to get in. They wouldn't let her in because she had bare shoulders. And one of the guides who was there said to her, well, I've been hired by an American couple to show them around Jerusalem. Why don't you join us? Come around with us. The guide had a friend who spoke to this young woman about Christ and to the Lord. She joined a messianic uh, community in, in, uh, in Tel Aviv, very legalistic one apparently, and after a while she got offended uh, and uh, uh, got away from the Lord, was living with a, with a, uh, with a guy having an on and off relationship with the Lord. Decided eventually she'd rather have the on and off relationship with the Lord without the guy than have the guy in no relationship with God, so she left him. Now she had all problems. Uh, she had a problem about the Trinity. Uh, she knew Jesus. She thought that God was good but not good enough. The way he treated Jesus with the cross was, was terrible. She couldn't understand that. She knew the Holy Spirit because she'd been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Couldn't understand the Trinity. It's remarkable because the day before she came us, to see us, she was walking in the pine forest next to the YM Basin in Lausanne, and uh, uh, God spoke to her. And God said to her, if you're somebody's friend, you have to let them be who they are. Isn't that right? And she said, that's right. He said, well, let me be God. Let me be God. <laughs> I want to be a trinity. Let me be a trinity. <laughs> but she came to this place where God was touching this central core of her being. And I'll never forget it. She struggled with it for a long, long time. What's going to happen? Don't know what's going to happen. And we prayed for her and she, she was crying all over the place. Gabriel had brought some tissues over and she took one of these white tissues out of the box and waved it in surrender. And she was through. See? Now, God hang us to this place here point. Once you're through that, God can give you everything. Up until that time, God is limited because we can misuse what he gives to us. See. Now here's the amazing thing. When you get to this point, you'll know when you're there because suddenly everything clarifies. Everything becomes so obviously simple. And you realize that you don't have to try to be a servant. You don't have to struggle to be a servant. You don't have to resolve to be a servant. You just have to what? Let it be. Paul was right, you discover. You just have to let this attitude be in you. It's already there, prepared in Christ. You have to let it be. And, and the law of God is written on your heart see, regarding servanthood. That becomes your nature. We can't overemphasize the, 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 the significance of the new covenant in, in terms of the law of the heart. Because what ha happens in this situation, God writes his law of servanthood on your heart. Serving is no longer a law to live by. It's no longer even a principle to follow or to apply. It becomes your heart motivation. It becomes your heart motivation. You become that, see, because it's already there for you, for you to receive. <clears throat> and it's when God brings us through to that point, then we become servants. I don't know how I don't know how uh, <clears throat> how more clearly to express it. It's like it's like it's like the new birth. <clears throat> you can't do it. You can't accomplish it. It's done for you. See. It's at that it's at that point of faith. In our, in our praying, I notice <clears throat> our struggle. There, I know a time. And these dealings in our life always begin with God. There's a divine...
And we need to recognize that divine initiative because this is not, we can't of our own volition decide we're going to be that or achieve that. There is a divine initiative that crosses our timeline at a certain point. And generally it's a point of need or a point of conviction. God starts to deal in our heart over some issues. It becomes a live issue with us. God begins to create, as it were, inner desperation in our hearts over some aspect. This business of servanthood, if you like. See. And when we respond to that, then God deals with us here as a, there's a time when, when the rule is seek and keep on seeking. And this struggling over self-emptying, over the disciplines of God in our life, of laying down our strengths, is seeking, 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 seeking. And oftentimes you walk in the dark, but then you come down to this point of faith here. And you always know when you've got to that point of faith because suddenly everything is so plain. And it's just ask and receive. And you ask and you receive, and it's there, see. And you wonder after, why didn't I manage to do that here? I don't know. I don't know. There, there, there is a time of God's dealings in our life to bring us to that point, see. And the, the extent of our responsibility is to walk with God in that time and know that God is moving in our life. He's bringing us to a place. And when I get to that place, I will know it. See. Because when you get to that place, suddenly the thing becomes utterly simple. And then it's just it's a receiving. And the law of servanthood. is written on our hearts. I would like uh, uh, us to take a few minutes just to reflect on that, because I sense this morning that there are some of you here that God has got pretty near to this omega point here we've been talking about. Something you've been concerned about for a long time. You, you want to have a heart like Jesus. See? We try to do it. I've tried to do it for years. See. We know what we ought to be. We try to do it. See. It's not doing, it's receiving. See. It's not struggling, it's surrendering. But we can't surrender until God brings us to that point where we realize, that now I'm at, I'm at the Jordan, see. and there's no way through that without just giving up. It, you can't have, <coughs> supposing at the end of the last war, when, when the, the Axis powers uh, 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 were defeated. They'd said, well, look, uh, you've won, now we've got certain conditions, let's, let's negotiate a settlement. <clears throat> the thing was, no, you surrender. See. You surrender, see. You surrender and, and, and the terms will be set for it. It's like God's dealings in our life like that. See. You surrender, see. And that's the only way to come to that place where the servant nature that Jesus created. You see, when Jesus went back to the right throne of God on high, he remains a servant, see. That's a remarkable thing. At the right hand of the majesty on high this morning, there is a man, a servant man, a man with a servant nature, ruling the universe, see? a God with a servant heart. See? And only, only those who, are, who have that, that servant heart can serve him, particularly in this area of, area of leadership. See? <clears throat> and God wants, I believe, to, to produce in the church leaders who have been born into that servanthood, it's not something they struggle to do. It's not even principles they live by. It's what they become. And the cross achieves that for us. And I dream, awake, but I dream of a time when, when the church of God, to begin with, <coughs> is led by leaders who are handling, have come to the cross, have been, have been born servants at the cross, get access to redeemed power at the cross, and out of that servanthood, lead the people of God, empower the people of God with redeemed power, see. What a church we have, see. More than that, <clears throat> that we produce in the church leaders who have that servant heart, have that servant character, and cause them to aspire to positions of leadership in the secular world, see. And display the glory of redeemed power there. I, <clears throat> I, would, I would like us just to pray. We do ask God if you want to go this way. It's a free choice. If you want to go this way? Say, God, I want, I want, I want to be at that place. See. I want you to deal with me, bring me through. 
So I have the heart of Jesus. So I have the servant heart of Jesus. It may be for some of you, I think there's some of you here <coughs> who are right at the point. <coughs> and you know because God has been touching it in your life, so that last internal citadel of your life. And you're saying to yourself, as I've said to myself, God, if this goes, I've got nothing left. And God says, that's exactly what I want. See? And when we open that door and let everything go, then God can give us everything that's on his heart. I remember that brother I spoke about, the Omega Point. I met him about, <coughs> about six months later at the Easter conference. <coughs> Only two times in my life I've ever met him. I've been speaking about this narrowing down, and after we're through the narrowing down, then God can give us everything. He said, Tom, you made only one mistake that night. I said, what was it? <clears throat> he said, you didn't make this big enough. See? God can trust us with anything after he's got our heart. See? Up until that time, there's always the risk of us misusing it. The best of, our, of us are misusing it. God wants to bring us to that place. Just let's pray before we before we break for a few minutes. <clears throat> <clears throat> Holy Spirit, we uh, yield ourselves to your Lordship this morning, to your dealings in our life <clears throat> over this area of servanthood, to your desire to bring us to the place where the servant nature that was born in Jesus Christ becomes part of us. Realize, uh, dear Lord, that we can't do it of ourselves. But we need to come to the cross and there to make that final surrender. I pray for brothers and sisters in this uh, room this morning who know beyond a shadow of doubt that you're touching the most sensitive spot in all of their lives. And one that they've guarded apprehensively for a long, long time. Uh, Lord, you've been pressing into them. Lord, I'm aware that these days it's good people you're after. It's committed people you're after. It's not the backsliders. It's not those who are walking you far off. And none of those, dear Lord, you're after your good people, your earnest people, your committed people. Because you want to bring, bring us through that Omega point where finally all our self-seeking, all our self-protection, all the... Uh, wrong attitudes in our all it finally goes because we open that inner citadel of our heart and we give you ourself. Lord, you don't need instructions as how to be Lord of our life. You are Lord, that's your nature. You call me Master and Lord, uh, you said, and so I am. We thank you, you're Master and you're Lord. You know how to be Lord. And Lord, we don't need to give you instructions as how to manage our life. All we need to do is to vacate the driving seat. For long last, take our hands off the steering wheel and to surrender to your absolute and utter lordship. And I pray, dear Lord, for those who this morning are facing that struggle, <clears throat> whose hearts are pounding a bit, they're, they're afraid, Lord, because that's the most vulnerable and precious place of our, own na of our whole nature. And yet, Lord, you've redeemed that. And we open our hearts to you this morning and we yield it. We surrender. We've got no conditions, Lord. We don't know how it's going to work out. <clears throat> we don't know what your requirements are. We're content just to surrender and to allow you for the first time in our life to be absolute Lord, to have the total control and the management of our affairs. I pray, Holy Spirit, that those uh, this morning uh, have to, who have come to that spot may be able to open the door allow you to take them through the Omega point into your servant heart, into your servanthood, dear Lord, so that we become what you are. And our motivation changes, and our desires change. We yield ourselves to you. And dear Lord, those of us who are on the way, we know that you're dealing with us, but we haven't got there. Lord, we patiently put ourselves in your hands. It's self-emptying we need to go through. Lord, we want to do it faithfully and obediently as you deal with, us, with our lives. Lord, I bless these brothers and sisters today. I sense in my heart, Lord, they're precious to you. Every one of their lives is precious to you, and their heart motivation is precious to you. And Lord, you'll deal with us as individuals and bring us through to that place, because that's your longing, that after what you went through on the cross, that servanthood should be born into the heart of those you choose to lead in your kingdom. 
In Jesus' name, amen.